Good Thursday morning here on the Crossboard Entry Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and we have a special show for you today. Um, Alberta has the third highest rate of self-reported spousal violence among Canadian provinces, yet family violence is preventable. November is Family Violence Prevention Month here in the province of Alberta. And today, we are going to be talking about that. We are going to be sitting down with Lana Bentley, a clinical social worker, as you see in the studio, social distance. We have all got our vaccinations. Um, and we're going to be talking about family violence prevention and family violence as well. Um, it is a time to increase awareness of the warning signs of family violence and the resources and supports available so we can work together to end family violence here in the province of Alberta. Now, before we continue, um, I would usually do this at the end of the show, but I'm going to do this now. This episode is going to be heavy. We are going to be digging into a lot of issues today, and I want everyone to know that if you are listening to this and you need to reach out, if you are listening to this and you hear stories or hear things that you see other people are going through that might be family violence, the support numbers, the helplines are in the show notes. So please reach out if you need help, if you need to talk to somebody, or if you can pass it on to someone who might need help as well, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, all Albertans, so the province of Alberta has started a social media campaign where they can show their support to you as Albertans on social media by using the hashtags GoPurpleAB or where to turn. And there's some resources in the show notes as well where you can share some of the information that we'll be talking about today because I, I, I really hope you do share some information and start having a conversation because that's what the show has been always about. It's about having conversations with people and uh, I'm hoping that today we can have a conversation where one person will hopefully not have to reach out, but if they need to, they have the uh, resources to reach out. Now, at the height on the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Canada, uh, Canada, the province of Alberta, brought in lockdown measures. They closed schools, and there was a lot of job losses, uh, raising concerns about the impact of the stressors on families and a possible increase to family violence. While the latest numbers of the pandemic are not out yet because we are still in it, uh, there has, according to uh, 19 police services across Canada, 18% lower overall reporting from March to October 2020 compared to the same time in 2019. Family rate related physical assault was down 4%, sexual assault down 10%, and they were also lower in the first eight months of the pandemic. Um, so we're going to be talking about some heavy stuff, as I just mentioned there. But I want to thank Lana for doing this because this is an important conversation and I'm glad we have been able to connect and talk about this. Well, thank you for having me, Chris. It's, it's good to be here uh, today and um, I always enjoy chatting with you. So hopefully today will be a rich conversation, albeit about uh, a very difficult topic. Um, I, I, I guess because I, if anyone's listening to this right now, they will be asking, why Lana? Why have Lana on the show to talk about this? So Lana, can you take me through who you are and how your role and your job relates to this pandemic in some sense? Sure. Um, so I've I've been working in this space, oh, Geez, now you're going to make me do some math. <laughs> now we're, we're going to age Lana here, people. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a sort of a lighthearted oh. moment here, and then everything else is going to be pretty happy. Um, so right now, um, I, I, I wear a couple of hats. So I teach at Mount Royal University. I teach at the University of Calgary, um, as you explained, Chris. Um, I am a clinical social worker, so I went to school for a bunch of years uh, to learn how to be a therapist. Um, but when I haven't worked as a therapist, um, I've worked in the not-for-profit sector. So right now I do work for a very large women-serving organization. 
and we operate um, a variety of services related to family violence. Even when I was working for Alberta Health Services, um, family violence was still super present. And by family violence, um, I'm referring to child maltreatment, elder abuse, and domestic violence, which I think is probably the one that for many folks is most synonymous with family violence. But family violence is an umbrella term that covers all the different relationships where violence can occur. So even when I worked um, in the area of mental health, still saw a lot of family violence. Either people would say it was either a part of their history that had had a very big impact on their present day functioning, or it was active in their lives by the time they came to see me, which complicated things for sure, uh, especially for kiddos. Um, figuring out how to discharge a child back home when they were done an inpatient admission, but there was issues related to family violence made things very difficult, right? Um, and when you're working with children, you're working with their caregivers. So um, certainly family violence has been present in much of the work I've done for nearly 20 years. It sounds weird to say that, but it's, it's been about that long now. Uh, but certainly um, present day, uh, I do work um, in the not-for-profit sector and, and a part of my role um, is related to uh, programs that either prevent um, intervene at an early stage of or treat the impacts related to um, family violence. Now, uh, before we continue on, I, I told this to Alana before the interview started, but I, I, I traditionally, as if you've listened to the show, I traditionally try not to do a lot of research on subjects because I want to be like you, the listener and the a viewer, learn a little bit from the person who I have on. But I wanted to do at least my due diligence to make sure that I had the information so that way I could ask the appropriate questions, but also ask poignant questions that we need to start asking. I will be honest. I, uh, I, I looked up on the Pro province of Alberta's website to find information about uh, family violence. And the last report that was released was in 2018. So I have no numbers from 2018 to 2021. That is a three-year period where I'm not sure what is going on, so I'm not going to have the most accurate information from the province of Alberta. The last report that came out was looking at from a five-year span from 2013 to 2018. So mm -hmm. these, these are old numbers that I'm going to be talking about. But what I do have, and this is this is stats can, these, these numbers came out in 2019. Lana just talked about family violence. And I want to give some staggering numbers here because when I read this and even mm -hmm. in our pre-pre-interview, I, I mentioned yeah. this. There were approximately 400,000 victims of police reported violent crimes in Canada in 2019. Of these, one quarter, 26%, were victimized by a family member. That is a spouse, a parent, a child, a sibling, or an extended family member. Women and girls account for two-thirds, 67% of all victims of family violence in 2019. Women and girls also accounted for over half of child and youth and senior victims of family violence, and almost four-fifths of all violent victims of immediate partner violence. Family violence that come to the attention of police were most often perpetrated by a current spouse, a parent, followed by a former spouse, a sibling, or a victim's child. These are staggering numbers. Um, this is for all of Canada, yet again, because I do not have more accurate information than I'm reporting with what I just said. This seems like it's been hidden. We don't mm -hmm. talk about family violence. And until you had actually talked to me about this month-long program, I went it wait this is actually happening i didn't realize this was a thing yeah what is your initial take on on 26 percent of violent crimes in canada were victim victims of a family member assault the first thing that comes up for me um well let, let me let me take a step back first of all you know 
Chris and I have stayed in contact since we first met during the election. I, I think he's a really awesome guy. And um, I, I wrote to him and said, I, I think I have a topic for your show. <laughs> and, and Chris, your response was so immediate of let's please connect and do this as soon as we can. Um, so thank you for using your platform to talk about this. So my initial take on those numbers is I couldn't, I, I agree with you. I, I think they're, they're very distressing. And I think what's even more distressing is that violence in relationships, one of the things that allows violence to persist for as long as it does in relationships is unfortunately there's still a lot of discomfort around what should I do if I suspect it might be happening. There was a survey a few years ago that showed that about two-thirds of Canadians either do know or suspect that somebody in their life is being impacted um, by domestic violence. However, they're not sure what to do. And part of that, I think, is that we are socialized to um, respect that what other people have going on in their family is their business. And, you know, you started today's conversation with such an important um, figure, which is since the pandemic, we've seen reported instances go down. And so the question is, what does that mean? And I would say that under, under non-pandemic circumstances, it is exceptionally hard for folks who are being impacted by violence to get the help that they need. So let's imagine for a minute, folks, that you are experiencing family violence and you are unable to leave your home, same, with, same as your partner, um, due to health restrictions. Now, now, the health restrictions were critically important um, to help us at a provincial city community level um, reduce the transmission of COVID-19 and keep people safe. But, but something to keep in mind is it would be really hard to call a hotline, to text, to access those resources outside of your immediate home when you're staying home. Yeah. And so I think, you know, you'd, I, I think you were gently surfacing what, what does that decrease mean and, and what are we to learn from it? And I, I would say um, we know that reporting for family violence doesn't reflect the occurrence of it. And so I think with these health restrictions, it's been a unique situation, Chris, where even if a person wanted to access help, it would be very difficult to do that with the person who is perpetrating violence against you and your loved ones being literally a few feet away from you. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the numbers that you shared are staggering. We know the ripple effect of family violence goes beyond just the two principal parties involved. This impacts communities. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, think, I think we have a lot to learn about the true impact of this pandemic, Chris. I, I, I don't think we know enough yet, others than to say, and, and I will share this, Chris, in Alberta specifically, and, and there was a study that was put out by the School of Public Policy here in town, and they, they talked about how as um, our energy sector has declined, calls to the police about family violence have actually gone up. So um, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, yeah. but I can't imagine um, that the pandemic has provided any protective factors against family violence. I'll leave it at that. And, and I appreciate that. And I, I'm going to jump in here for Please. a second because um, the, the, the two highest provinces, uh, so Alberta is the third highest for family violence in the, the country of Canada. The highest is Saskatchewan. This, uh, I, I've read reports, and this was probably about two or three days ago, where Saskatchewan saw a massive increase in family violence when the oil and gas sector started to take a downturn. So it does play a factor in this. Um, I want to also mention here for a second that I got up this morning at one o'clock. Uh, for those who are watching, you know that I've been going through cancer treatments and uh, my sleep pattern hasn't been the best, but I woke up this morning at one o'clock because uh, a few houses down from where I lived, there was a domestic mm. sparring match going on. Mm. Um, I heard pretty clearly um, the B word, the F word, 
all the words thrown and it was uh i'm assuming if you're up at one o'clock you're either very happy or very drunk Mm -hmm. i'm going to say the latter for this one i called the cops because after i read these numbers i don't want to take that chance that i could be potentially stopping someone from getting help that they need Uh, The cops came, Calgary Police Services did come, and they uh, looked for the gentleman who was screaming at 1.30 till about 3 o'clock on our street, and hopefully everyone is safe. I don't know where where it stands, because the police couldn't find them. But if you see something, you have to say something. The reporting number here, like Lana just said, it's not because... I, 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 I would put money dollar to dime right now that it's not because people aren't being assaulted, aren't being attacked, but it's the, I'm locked in with this person and where do I go? Mm-hmm. And if you see something, and I hate to say this, but if you see something, please say something. Stand up, make your voice be heard because you can't walk by and just, turn a blind eye to this because it's not the appropriate thing to do well chris the, the you know it's it's so hard to know what to do however i i think to your point um and you've heard me say this before it was my campaign slogan the difference that makes the difference but you never know if a call to the police is going to be the difference that makes the difference and i think before we even get to that crisis point we have to embrace the idea that yes something might happen behind closed doors but that doesn't mean it's not an issue that our community should care about i do think in calgary there is a very neighborly spirit (laughs) and and relative to other other cities that i have visited in other parts of the country i'm not going to say which ones because i don't i can already see you getting people flooding your comment box saying i can't believe she said that um but i i do think that uh social inclusion and knowing your neighbor and living in communities where people do take it upon themselves to say you know i haven't seen so and so in a while or it seems like they've become more distant i haven't seen their kids at soccer practice you know, observing those things doesn't make you intrusive or a bad neighbor. It just speaks to the curiosity and the need for connection. And we know that in communities where there are, where there is more social cohesion and investment in one another, and I'm certainly not saying be that nosy neighbor who's all up in somebody else's business, but to your point, Chris, I think there's a lot of people who are watching your show tonight who I would hazard a guess have had a sneaking suspicion or have seen or heard something and because they didn't want to seem rude, yeah. th- th- they didn't either ask or or they didn't place a call. And and I know that I, I know that there's social pressures, and we were all raised by our parents to be polite. Um, it's the Canadian way. Well, you know, for me, I remember when I was training to be a therapist. One of my first supervisors said, "When it comes to safety." it's always better to overdo rather than underdo. If you got it wrong, you can apologize after the fact. And here's the good thing. If that other person is alive and safe to hear the apology, then we're cool. There is risk, however, when we become disconnected from one another. And and I I know there are going to be some people who are watching this, Chris, who might not really resonate with that argument, but let me frame this a different way. If we look at the cost to communities where these issues are not addressed, it is considerable. Contact with emergency services, children becoming, um, or the state having to intervene to become guardians of kids where there is family breakdown, um, hospitalizations, homelessness. Domestic violence is one of the big drivers for women into homelessness. Not to mention the disruption for people who are impacted by DV to the workforce. So even, even if there are folks watching today, Thursday, and they're thinking, you know, I'm just not comfortable and, and I believe that everybody, you know, what happens behind closed doors is what happens behind closed doors. But, you know, I think, Chris, we've, we've reached a point where beyond the social argument, and, and I know you're a very community-focused guy, you care about your neighbor, et cetera, 
um, there is oh, an econ it's, it's, economic argument to be made for addressing this as well. It's not that at all. And the, the, it kind of, it's going to be a little bit selfish here, but I'm going to say it because say it. the last time a commotion happened outside my house, someone came to my door with a gun. And this was like during the election. So um, I was literally gun shy that this could happen again. I, 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 I looked at that number. I will admit that I saw that number and I thought, okay, I need to do something about it. But it was also for my safety as well. Because like you said, it can spill over into the streets. Mm -hmm. It Like you might think that what happens behind closed doors is going to stay behind closed doors. No, um, it's not. And I am going to say that right here, right now. Because... They will still be your neighbors tomorrow morning. They will still be your family members tomorrow morning. You will have to address why you didn't do something if you don't do something. If you do not call, then you have to address and you have to look into yourself and say, why didn't I do something? If that next morning you find out a person's died or a person's being taken away in handcuffs, you have to figure out what you could have done. And I'm not saying go intervene, go knock on no, that door. Yeah. Don't put yourself at risk. No, exactly. Yeah. Do not put yourself at risk. But I'm saying if the, if the smallest act of, that you can do is to just even call our uh, mm -hmm. emergency services, then that is what you can do. Mm -hmm. And yet, yet again, 1.30 is not an appropriate time to be yelling at your partner at any, or any hour is not appropriate. But um, people were turning on their lights and i'm assuming i'm the only one who called because the cops yeah. were the only ones they only came up to our house so I, I i would just say i hope the for the everyone they're doing well i do not know who they are i just know that we have them on ring camera and we gave it to the cops of here's what they were saying to each other because mm -hmm. someone was going to get hurt if no one stepped in i do want to take this moment for a second and say because we've been mentioning family violence, mm -hmm. and I don't think we've actually addressed what that means. Right. So according to the uh, government of Canada, family violence refers to, refers to violence committed by spouses, legally married, separated, divorced, and common law. That also parents, biological step, adoptive, and foster, children, biological step adopted and foster siblings biological step i don't need to read that over again and extended family members and this is the big thing it can happen from grandparents uncles aunts cousins in-laws and intimate partner violence refers mm -hmm. to violence committed by current or former legally married spouses common law partners dating partners and other intimate partners we we were, we we're going to be talking about a lot of things today, but I want to also address this. We're not just saying that this only happens to men and women. We're not saying that because 67% of those violent crimes are women. Um, women are the uh, recipients of the 67% of violent crimes. Men are recipients as well. Children are recipients. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to address that because I think there is a stigma that men don't get attacked. Men mm -hmm. don't get assaulted. They do. And the other area that we want to talk about is it is not physical. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can be mental. And that's the big one. And that's what we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Some experience from myself. But in your field... Mm -hmm. In the city of Calgary, mm -hmm. and I you don't need don't tell me about uh, specific uh, incidents because I know confidentiality. But how, what what's the breakdown that you've seen? Is it more physical than mental, or is it more mental than physical? You're you're bringing up a really good question, Chris. <laughs> because um, I try. Yeah. <laughs> So here, here's the tough part about breaking down the different forms of violence is what most people anticipate when they hear about family violence services are women's shelters who do tend to deal with, though not exclusively, I, I want to be very clear, um, those services do tend to be um, for people 
who are in acute crisis and acute distress and, and you know, based on their circumstance, they, they no longer feel like they can stay at home. So what we also know to be true, though, is that violence in relationships is not just physical, to your point. It can be psychological, financial, emotional, spiritual. Um, I would also say sexual assault also occurs within partnered relationships and probably doesn't get talked about enough because I would say it's an even more taboo um, form of violence in um, intimate uh, partner relationships. So I think that the challenge is that a lot of the domestic violence services that you know um, the average Calgarian might know about, they associate it with a shelter. And I do think that for many, they would understand that to mean somebody who is at imminent risk of physical harm. Now, I, I don't have the specific numbers to how many shelter beds exist in Calgary, but certainly I think we can all um, agree that there's probably far more people experiencing family violence than there are shelter beds. So, though, though, though not helpful, I think people are apt to, um, potentially say, if, if I'm not at imminent physical risk, then maybe I don't need to end this relationship, or maybe my safety's not um, as under threat as somebody who's experiencing physical. So what I would say to that is words can hit as hard as fists. Sometimes even harder. Right, and, and the challenge about violence in relationships is that we can't say with certainty that just because your partner has never become physical, it means they won't. And violence usually within the context of, let's say domestic violence, just to focus on that one. So, so let's say we're talking about a couple who's dating, common law, legally married, whatever the case might be. Um, you know, when I used to work in a therapeutic capacity, I would say to folks, part of, part of why a lot of people don't come forward is because of the shame and a sense of embarrassment and oh my goodness, how am I gonna tell people that this happened to me? Yeah. But, but violence, physical violence doesn't just come out of nowhere, Chris. It, violence in relationships can over time unfold because over time a person's boundaries just get so picked away at and degraded that it really does open the door, if you will, to physical assault. And so that is a process of breaking down a person. Iso they become increasingly isolated. The relationship becomes um, potentially, depending on how isolated they are, they may start to think, um, there is no one else who's ever gonna love me others than this person. So this is it for me. No one will believe me. This is my fault. I can fix my partner. So I, I share this because I think that all forms of violence are meant to be taken seriously. To your point though, Chris, there are some that are more immediately lethal than others. But yeah. I, I would, if, if there's somebody watching your program today who's saying, well, I, I've never been hit before, um, I would still say honor, well not honor, obey your instincts. And if something is unsafe, um, it's, it's still serious. And, and you know, th there's no need to compare your feeling, um, your feelings towards someone else and say, well, it's not as bad as that person, so I don't deserve to get help or I don't need to get help. And I would also say part of emotional abuse and, and psychological abuse is isolation. Yeah. So the more isolated a person becomes, I would say the more vulnerable they are to escalating violence because there's fewer people in their network to say, hey, are you okay? And so um, I know you haven't brought this up specifically, but when you and I talked in our pre-pre-interview, um, you had surfaced the question about you know LGBTQ2S plus folks and violence, and, and I had shared with Chris that similarly, um, the reports don't necessarily align with the actual occurrence, but um, and I don't want to generalize because I think everybody, the LGBTQ2S plus community is certainly very diverse, but, but we do know that for, for folks who are in relationships um, that are queer in nature, um, whatever language I think fits, we do know that 
the possibility of isolation can unfortunately be even greater there for folks whose family and friend networks may not be affirming or supportive of their gender, sexual identity. Um, so the isolation there can, can actually be a bit more intense. And then I think there's a lot of unhelpful attitudes um, about the couples from that community, which would make it even harder um, to and, access help. And um, this, so um, I will be the first to admit I do not have all the answers and I do not want to generalize and stereotype anyone who's out there listening to this right now, but I would say that um, while I'm happy that we have a police force that came and did their duty to look after police service, sorry, to look uh, to look into the call that I made. I can imagine that there are some uh, in the LGBT two plus Q community who are afraid to call the police mm. or afraid to reach out to services because uh, if you get misgendered or mm -hmm. if you uh, if you have a a police officer arrive at your house and there's two men living in that house and is it your roommate is it your partner and it it, it can be hard because uh while i i, I don't want to say that uh, like all cops are gonna misgender you or uh, look at you because you're gay lesbian transgender i will say that there's probably a higher rate of people in our in the lgbtq community who's a who doesn't want to reach out even in that situation where they right. might getting abused because of that and you know, i hope not me too me, me, i mean first of all you hope people never have the need um to, yeah. to call the police um but i think as well chris you know i'm thinking so maybe let's go with the two guys and and two ladies like just even there yeah I think that unfortunately, um, if it's two guys, when people don't understand what you and I were just talking about, which is the psychological and emotional component of abuse, mm -hmm. making you feel less than fear, intimidation, I think unfortunately some people who harbor, I think, homophobic views, and maybe they wouldn't identify them as such, but well, if it's two guys, they should just be able to, you know, he should just be able to handle himself. Yeah because of his physical stature. And similarly, I think when it's two women, we see those unhelpful attitudes of, it's just two women, how serious can it be? All forms of interpersonal violence are can and should be taken seriously. So I'm about to mention something here that not a lot of people know. I, in our pre-pre-interview, as we talked about, I uh, told this to Lana and I said I'd be bringing it up. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the reasons why I moved out west, but this is not the main reason I moved out west. Main reason was money, but that's here nor there. In uh, 2010, I started a new relationship after my partner had passed away from a drunk driver. And I was in that position. I was in that position where I didn't think anyone would love me. I thought uh, no matter what, I would be alone for the rest of my life. And uh, I met somebody and... May, may not have been the best situation, but I was happy because I had someone in my life and I, this is where I can not sympathize with uh, people who are going through domestic violence right now because I know that you think you can change them. You think you can do better. You, you think you, you, you're the luckiest person in the world and it's all your fault. Um, this relationship lasted for two years. By the end of the second year, in March of 2013, so so it, we started the relationship in December 2010, uh, and then in 2013, so three years, sorry, in March, uh, it was discovered that this guy, this asshole, was stealing from me. And not a minor amount of money, but a significant amount of money. Um, I confronted him. Uh, he said, well, you've been dating me and you need to make sure that my weed habit is always there. You need to make sure that I always have weed and you have money. I don't. I'm not working. You are. So I need you need to make sure that you have the you, you give me money. So that way I'm happy. And if I'm happy, then you're happy. And I said, no, I'm done. 
Uh, I, I don't take kindly to people who steal from me and I just give me the money. The gentleman went to grab the money that was on the counter. I stopped him. He left after uh, attacking me. The police came because I called the cops because I was attacked. And I was sentenced to anger management because I should have just let him go. And I was not charged as a... Uh, I was not charged. I was not... Uh, I was just told that you will go to anger management so that way you don't lash out and attack someone smaller than you because he was a smaller guy. Mm -hmm. So I was the victim of an assault... I was the victim of theft, and yet I get sentenced to anger management because I'm the bigger guy in the relationship. So I can imagine there are people out there who are hearing the exact same story that they're going through right now. And in gay relationships, male, women relationships, that sometimes the assumption is to jump to say it's the male's fault. Hmm. And that's just my personal opinion because this is where I've seen it. And like we have talked about, Lana and I so said, women can assault men as well. So I want people to realize that men can be on the receiving end of assault, physical or mental or emotional. So I, <coughs> I want to say that my situation is one-off, I hope. I hope it's one-off. I hope there's not a lot of people who out there who had to go through what I had to go through. But it's hard to call the cops when you have to look over your shoulder and think that because you're the bigger one in the relationship, they're going to automatically assume you're the one who did something wrong. So Therapy time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, that was like I'm, I'm just really sorry that that happened to you um obviously the positive outcome for me is that you're here today and, yep and you now have a platform where you might help somebody in a relationship like the one you just described or even somebody who's you know like like at a certain point at a certain point, I think there are some really big common elements in in relationships where domestic violence is present, Chris. And I think your story might it might help somebody recognize that like what I heard when you shared was there's financial abuse. Yep. There was emotional abuse. Yep. There was gaslighting. Yep. You know? And and that's exactly what we talked about a few minutes ago was how all those things open the door and make it possible for physical acts of violence and so i i hope for those who are listening today um one of the key things that chris described was that this occurred over time in the relationship yeah. and and that and right? lana says it said, said it perfectly at the beginning of the interview you might go into a relationship thinking oh this person this person's perfect nothing bad's right. going to happen no one's going to she they're not going to attack me he or she or they are not going to attack me but it took a lot for me to trust people after that relationship mm -hmm. uh i still and i love my husband to death and i trust him to the end of the world but there are days when i go into my bank account because i i i i've been a I, you get PTSD in some sense, and I'm not saying that this is completely PTSD, but uh, I, I I have more control over what's going on in my world now than I did during that relationship because I didn't think I was a happy person. <laughs> Journalism is in crisis, 
And our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. The point of there's two things that stand out to me. Number one, there's the idea of victim blaming, and I think that a variety of different systems over the years have said to folks, "Well, why didn't you leave? Or why didn't you see the warning signs?" You know, putting the responsibility on the person who was on the receiving end of the violence. So I can talk about that. I'll, I'll say that. I'll say why I had people ask me afterwards, why didn't you leave? You it's must complicated. have complicated. And it, and and it's I, I would I would sum it up with the this quick statement. I didn't think I'd be loved afterwards. Mm. I didn't think that I would find someone else. And you hear that a lot from people. And I am one of those people. I am one of those people that will say that I, I I came out later on later on in life, and I didn't have that many relationships, and I st- I, I uh, my sexual awakening didn't happen until later on in life, and when it did, I met the love of my life at the time, and mm-hmm. he passed away from a drunk driver, and this smooth talking a hole came along at Tim Hortons one night, and I said, hey. Let's go on a date. And I put myself out there, and three years later, I had a knife in my stomach. Well, you know, Chris, to, 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 that, to that point about the smooth talking, but, but I, I would say that the challenge of these relationships from the folks I've worked with over the years is that when the person is not being violent, they may actually be quite charming or lovable. Um, you know, there, there are certainly folks, Chris, where violent behavior transcends their families as well. Yeah. And they are violent um, all the time across multiple different contexts. However, um, it is the case that, that people are, are complicated, even the ones who use violent abusive behavior. And so part of what makes it so complicated is that people tend to be three-dimensional in real life. And so when the person isn't being violent, there may be episodes um, or periods of time where they're considerate and loving and they're the life of the party when your friends come over. And all of those things make it confusing as to if, if you're going to make a yes or no decision of do I keep this person in my life or not, but their behavior is inconsistent. And sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's distant, sometimes it's violent. And if there's been enough emotional manipulation and isolation, it genuinely becomes harder to determine, is this where I need to be? So I I think if there's anybody watching today saying, how do I support somebody who's in a relationship like that? One of the first things I would say is let's, let's let go of judgment. Yeah. Right? This isn't about, well, I told you that this person seemed, you know, sketchy. We, we need to move past that. If you are trying to support somebody you love, please um, understand how complicated this is for them. Yeah. And it's really more so about them knowing that you're there for them, you support their safety, you care about them. This isn't about shaming them because they probably already have enough feeling bad about themselves as is. We have to let go of those, I told you so, I knew this was a slick talk. Do you know what I mean? Like, like that, that's not helpful. It's not helpful, but also on uh, uh, a double-edged sword here, yeah. sometimes it can backfire if you say that. Because then, because the, the victim would say, well, it was one-off. He's right. he's he's a lovely guy, or she's a lovely guy, or they're a lovely guy. The person, yeah. Um, they it, it was one night. He he's promised. They've promised me they'll, they'll never, never do, do it again. again. Yeah. Um, 
my child is safe. He would never harm my child. That's right. like if you've ever watched any horror film, if you ever say that in any film, you know that something's about to happen. Right. So and I'm not joking about that because I, I, I joke about that, but I'm not at the same time because these are the go to lines that sometimes victims will use. And I, I, I use them as well because I thought to myself, well, I've gone through anger management. I've not gotten the money back that he stole. I am uh, still lonely, so what if I take him back? Maybe it was just a one-off thing. Maybe he's actually apologetic, and I, I remember that he kept on sending messages to me, and message after message, because they're trying to make themselves feel good as well, right? Oh, uh, because they know that once they have a victim, they will be able to run with that victim. Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. I want to make sure that people know that I'm not saying that all victims do this. I'm just saying from my personal experience and from the experience that I've talked to from other people who have gone through domestic violence, family violence, that it is a there are moments when you have to realize that sometimes, like Lana said, saying I told you so might not be the most appropriate thing to say. No, and and, and as well. In the story Chris described, obviously, there was a very unfortunate, violent incident. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm just so glad you're here. Um, and, you know, your theory that you would never find somebody who loves and respects you was proven wrong. And here he Just had to find a Jewish guy. That's all I'm saying, ladies and gents. Or oh, Lana. <laughs> I have no idea how to respond to that. But, but, but I, I, I think that... In Chris's story, the thing is, is that when you're in the middle of that scenario, it actually does seem impossible, yeah. right, to imagine a future where anything could be different. And that's where the isolation piece becomes so dangerous. But something to keep in mind is even if somebody is in a relationship characterized by abuse, maybe they haven't left or ended it, but that doesn't mean they're not doing things to survive and keep themselves or the people under their care safe. There's, There's something, something called the response-based response -based model, um, and I'm by no means an expert in it, but it works off the assumption that even if people are still in a relationship where somebody is being violent towards them, that person is still making choices and engaging in small acts of resistance yeah. to keep themselves safe. And it's important for those of us who want to be a part of that community of support to remind folks of that. Okay. So you haven't left yet. There are still things that you're doing to stay alive. There are still small acts of resistance that you're engaging in that honor and protect your personhood. And I think that we have to remember that violence in relationships doesn't exist in a vacuum. The solutions aren't going to be singular. Um, and we also need to remember that people are complicated and somebody can be on the receiving end of violence and be a victim, but they're still doing things to stay alive and survive. And I would also say for those who are engaging in violent behavior, because there might be folks watching your show today, Chris, who are on the other side of this fence and they're the ones engaging in violent abusive behavior. So to anybody who's doing that, I want you to hear you don't have to do that and 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 it might feel like coming forward and saying i do that and and i don't know how to stop or i don't know where to go you can still access the help and support that you need to show up in non-violent and non-abusive ways and and i know that that might seem like an odd message for me to be delivering, but I think it's one that needs to be shared. Um, family Violence Prevention Month is about preventing family violence. 
And that's something for everybody in our city, in our neighborhoods, and in our province to hear. So um, from my end, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled anytime somebody walks through the doors of a place like the one where I work and says, today's a new day where I can begin again. We have talked about uh, partner relationships when it yeah. comes to Family Violence uh, Prevention Month. But we want, I want to turn our sights now to th- the, the children. Yes. Um, as I said, I'm just going to pull up this data again just to make sure that people are aware. Women and girls also account for over half of child and youth and senior victims of family violence. Mm-hmm. Kids are often, and I don't want to say often, but kids are, from time to time, can be outlets. They can be outlets for joy. They can be outlets for happiness. And sometimes, and I, I, I don't know what goes through people's minds when they do this, and anyone who touches a child in any way, physical or emotionally like this, it's hard, and I would say... Come at me. If you want to go after a child, come at me first. I've gone through a lot in my life, and if you're touching a child and you're physically assaulting them, stop it. And I I know Lana said it more eloquently than I did, but when it comes to children, I don't have time for you. I do not have time for you to even try to apologize for touching a child in a physical way. Um... We currently have a counselor mm. who a friend, a friend of theirs, if I'm not mistaken, 16 year old child at the time. He was the Calgary Police Service member and he assaulted a 16 year old. This was a child. Children are on the receiving end of this as well. And I want to talk about the physical part of this first. As the clinical social worker here, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose this I'm, I'm gonna pose this question to you, and I apologize for anyone who's listening to us on the deer foot right now or listening to this child. Please turn it down for about two seconds. What the fuck is wrong with people who physically assault children? Who you're supposed to be there to protect them, to nurture them, mm-hmm. and you t- physically assault them, emotionally assault them. What the fuck is wrong with people now you can turn it back up well so so i'm, I'm gonna share an idea chris and, and i can't take credit for it my my colleague kim shared it to me shared it with me and she said she read it i forget who the primary author is but she said if you don't transform your pain you transmit it and i think unfortunately for grown-ups who don't understand that kids um, are especially vulnerable because when you're a child, your relationships are characterized by dependence. Do you know what I mean? Yes. There's, there's no shortage of adults looking after you, yeah. telling you what to do, protecting you, feeding you, um, keeping a roof over your head. And um, anytime you hear about a child being hurt, it's outrageous. And, and, and I do think... Um, you, you, you did, did mention, mention uh, the city, city councillor uh, who we, we currently have. Um, I, I will say it's always outrageous when a child is harmed, but it's especially um, disgraceful when they're harmed by somebody in a position of authority who is supposed to maintain public trust and, and actually protect communities. So I think that's what... Like, Like it's it's always unacceptable, but it's especially gross to think about folks in positions of authority um, using that to further take advantage, manipulate, and exploit. Um, So you have not asked me the question, but I'll say it, uh, resign. Anyways, um, going back to uh, the other question, I I think that when we look at child maltreatment, we, we, we know, know that this, this unfortunately, is an issue that doesn't discriminate. Um, it cuts across um, all different sorts of characteristics. And 
you've, you've introduced, Chris, the concept of adverse childhood events. events. Call those ACEs. So, so an adverse, adverse childhood event is an event that occurs within that really critical developmental window for kids. And in that critical window, the job of a child is really just to grow <laughs> and, and to build the foundation of, of health and wellness for the rest of their life. And enjoy themselves. <laughs> yes, and to, and, and to give their parents a few gray hairs along the way, as, as I did. Um, but, but those adverse childhood events are so critical, Chris, because... When, when children, children are growing, growing up and their brains are literally being developed and the part of their brain that's responsible for uh, problem solving, processing information, um, figuring out what behavior is appropriate for a situation, so um, their executive function, these sorts of events or conversely positive events actually help the brain develop. And when kids are exposed to abuse, violence, or community or societal level issues like food insecurity, poverty, growing up in areas that are, you know, loud and noisy, and there's more access to alcohol and drugs than there is libraries and recreation, um, that has a negative impact on the way that child's brain grows, and specifically the part of their brain that's going to set the foundation for them to make good choices and be good citizens. So. You know, I, I think the impact of child maltreatment is very, very far-reaching. And as adults, we do know that there are some instances of child maltreatment, Chris, that are more on the neglect end of things, where you might have loving parents or caregivers, but they, they don't have the resources, and so kids go without. But then you have people who engage in emotional, psychological, physical, or sexual abuse of kids, and, and those are folks who... Um, th their, their behavior, behavior to your point, point. Um, certainly um, inexcusable right and, and, and I don't and anyone who's going to send in messages and say well uh, if you have to even send in a comment actually to try to say what I just said was wrong that sometimes people are not mentally there when they assault a child give your head a shake and just stop listening to my show right now just stop it because we need are you okay i'm i'm triggered right now um our children we are kids like like long just said our kids are supposed to have fun they're supposed to grow up in a safe world if someone is assaulting them even might not have the best IQ or the best mental capacity. It's still wrong. You you do not get to play the, well, Johnny is an ass because he's he has low IQ. I'm sorry. You touch a kid, I have no time for you. And if you have sympathy for anyone who has touched a child, again, just stop watch. Just turn turn this off. Unsubscribe and don't come back because I don't want you here. So so would now be a good time to maybe talk about what are some of the solutions? <laughs> and 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 I, I don't say that to make light, but to your point, Chris, I I think you've surfaced. So this is going to be the question that you inevitably get, right? Is people are going to say, well, we know these issues are happening. What should we do? Which is true, but I want I want to talk about one last one before yeah, we, we talk about the what should we do. Yeah. We talked about parents attacking kids. Right. But kids can be emotionally assaulting as well to their parents. Are you thinking about elder abuse? No, I'm thinking of 14, 15 year olds who attack their siblings. Mm. 14, 15 year olds who physically assault their parents. For, uh, parents who physically might emotionally, mentally abuse their grandparents. Mm -hmm. It does happen. Okay. Kids can be can assault people as well, physically, mentally, emotionally, you name it. So we are trying to uh, encompass as much as we possibly can in the next, in the last hour and a bit. But I want to let you know that this is a complex situation, and Lana and I have tried our best to try to best to give you the details as we can. But like Lana said, 
what can we do mm-hmm. as a society, as a member of your family, as a friend of someone who you see going through this? What can we do? So as the clinical social worker in the group, because I am the podcast host, and let's be honest, <laughs> my, my, my education was political science and journalism, so it's not the best for giving us advice on what we should do, but what can we do? This is going to happen no matter what we say here, but I hope it doesn't. Well, you know, Chris and I have only known each other but a few short months, but I, I think... July! <laughs> Fair to say he already knows I, I am I am an optimist and, and I try to be a positive. I'm a uh, pessimist. No, New no, podcast I, show, The Optimist and Pessimist. I, 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 I don't think I don't think you're a pessimist at all. I, I think you're giving voice to the frustration and at times helplessness that people feel around okay, so now that we're talking about these issues more publicly, they just feel so enormous and overwhelming. Is, is there, there anything, anything we can do? And I, I believe, yes, there is. is. And, and and I do, do want to say, Chris, I, you know, we are socially distant in his studio. That That, that is a true tale. Uh, but, but I could still feel the emotion coming at you when you, coming from you, rather, when you were talking about children. And, you know, I, I think just to riff off of that statement that my colleague Kim gave to me, if you don't transform your pain, you transmit it. I would say there's also power to transmitting the feelings of, of frustration you you can transform the frustration you can transform the helplessness and if you transform it with the intensity and power that i felt coming from you we've got this as as a society and i mean that sincerely and and part of the appeal to me of coming on your show was this is a political audience who wouldn't necessarily chris Seek, seek this out. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here, here today, today as your guest, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> journalist, <laughs> Polly Sci Guy, <laughs> talking to, <laughs> no, seriously, yeah. talking to a new audience. And, and this, this is how we start the work. work. So, but okay, yeah. I, 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 I agree completely. Okay, that sometimes you need to start the conversation. But, but then, then what? But <laughs> we live in a 24 hour, 365 day a year, seven day a week, yeah. social media, 15 minute fame. Right. Um, we can talk to the end of the earth. New flashy meme of a cat kissing a puppy or a cat and a chimpanzee on YouTube goes yeah. viral. That gets more play than this because people don't want to have the hard conversations. So how can we have the conversations? Because, okay, do we have to wait until a counselor is accused of sexual mm-hmm. assault to have the conversation? Do we have to wait till... The family member gets shot at one o'clock in the morning yelling at their partner when I got woken up last night. When do we have the conversation and when can we start having the conversation that doesn't last 15 minutes and then it's over? Right. <laughs> that's where I'm at. And that's that's where the shows come from. It's <laughs> let's have this conversation, but let's have it in an honest to goodness open discussion because we're just not doing that anymore. So, so, so my, my response, skirting an issue, to your question is, what if I said you don't have to do it all? And my invitation to you and to your viewers is to first of all ask yourself, if it, like let's let's say there's a continuum of things that you could do, right? So you could choose to work with folks where violence has already happened and then you could be a me where, where you manage an inpatient unit or you work as a family therapist. Or, Chris, you could be a community guy. You could be a community guy who invests in the protective factors that prevent violence. So earlier I said those adverse childhood events, for example. Well, there's another side of the fence. Mm-hmm. We, we just, just had, had a municipal election, election and, and I am glad you, you brought that up in, in so far as your city councillors um, have the ability through planning, <laughs> right, um, and funding to create communities that um, foster social inclusion, to create neighborhoods where there is access to affordable recreation. We have all different orders of government who can make sure that neighborhoods have what they need to be free from violence. And so those prevention factors, let's also talk a little bit, Chris, about how earlier you started with the pandemic 
and we talked about how oof, it's going to be tough for people to access crisis services when they're literally um, stuck in a house with their, you know, partner or family member, whomever, whomever it might be. So, so we also know that part of this is making sure that the people who do my work at that end of the continuum have adequate resources. But simply investing in crisis services isn't enough. That just helps us deal with the crisis. It doesn't prevent it. And so we know that neighborhoods where there's access to recreation, lots of educational opportunities, employment, adequate housing, where people are not um, fighting to meet the basic necessities of life, these are all important protective and prevention type factors. But there's also, Chris, what you're doing, which is let's pull the camera back one step further. And this is now the society level interventions which is changing attitudes. It's influencing government. It's changing and shifting ideology. And, and that's what a show like this does in my mind, is it changes people's minds. And, and you will, I think, get some comments <laughs> sent to you about today's broadcast. And that's OK, because I'd rather have people talking about the issue than not. So. There's a bunch of different ways that people can get involved, but fundamentally, you already said you're going to have the resources listed in your in your notes. Um, we're going to provide that information for folks who want to get involved at all points along that continuum. But all I'll say really quickly, because um, our, our conversations always go on forever and a day. I, well, last time we talked, I think we I started the conversation by saying, we'll be here for half hour, 40 minutes, and that was... Two hours later, yeah, of me yeah, going, uh, okay. Yeah, Chris, Chris and I are never <laughs> quick with our conversations, but but, but, but I would also say um, you don't have to do everything in order to do something. You, you have a diverse viewer base that will appeal to people who are politically active. You will have other people who are influ. I would say you're an influencer now, like it or not, Chris. <laughs> I want the blue check mark on YouTube now, guys. <laughs> you know, like, like you, you were telling me your stats of how many people listen to your show. So you, you now have a very big platform, and you've chosen to use it, I've noticed, in recent weeks, just about issues of importance to Calgarians. And then there's going to be people who work in my industry watching today, and there's also just going to be people who are like, you know what, now I am actually going to ask my neighbor if they're doing okay. Now I am going to go online, and we'll, click, we'll put the links up for this, but there's hand signals that people can give quietly to alert you to the need for help if they're experiencing yes. violence so we're going to put all that up there so folks you don't have to do everything but there's there's things you can do we have the resources for you right we have done the work we have done the uh the the research to the bottom of the barrel of what what information we need to get out there for you and like i said like i've said in a few episodes in the last few weeks uh i'm going to get some things wrong I will ask the stupid question from time to time. I will ask the question that I want to ask because we need to learn. We need to figure out what we can do here. And just to piggyback on Alana's statement here for a second. Telling people that you're here for them mm -hmm. goes a long way. That small, you might not say, hey, is everything okay? It might just be, Lana, you need anything i'm here to talk mm -hmm. and just walk away because they might not realize the victim the person in trouble might not realize they need help until they hear those words and they look inside and they go holy shit i do need help mm -hmm. um don't go in guns a blazing do not go in and say hey is johnny or is sarah or is ethel don't know why Ethel came to my head, but Ethel uh, abusing you, do not, because that is going to make people retreat faster than you can think possibly. It is a very hard situation, but is a conversation we need to start having. And to your point, this is one platform. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping this is airing on the 22nd. Or the 22nd? Oh, God. The, totally the 22nd today. On, on, the, on the Thursday. <laughs> the second. Thursday. The, totally. Um, I hope 
We still have a few days left of this month. I hope CTV, Global, CBC does a story like this as well. Mm. Because I'm one small little podcast. I'm an influencing, influential podcast, I guess now. <laughs> but we need to all be talking about this. I, I, I subscribe to the Alberta province, the province of Alberta's news releases. I have not gotten a news release about this. I didn't, like I said, I didn't know until Lana reached out and said, hey, let's have a conversation about this. And I was like, yes, let's do it. Why not? Yeah. Why can't we? Because we need to start having these conversations. <sighs> I... I know that the last hour and a bit has been challenging. Yeah. Um, for those who have listened to this whole thing, thank you. Mm-hmm. To those who have listened to the whole thing, if you need help, if you need someone to talk to, our DMs on the Crossboard Interview podcast via Instagram, via YouTube, via um, Twitter, Facebook are open. If you need to just shoot me a message and say, Let's talk. I will be there to listen to you. I may not be the best person to listen to you, but I can point you in the right directions if you're afraid to start that process. I've been where you are. Uh, I know that sometimes it's hard to ask for help when you're, you're drowning. So if you need someone to reach out to, uh, Lana is here. She's on social media as well. I'm here. Um, but also, if you want it to be anonymous, there are resources available. Um, I'm just going to read this off because I want to make sure that, because sometimes you may not be able to find it in the show notes, but um, the Family Violence Info Line is 310-1818, and it's available toll-free for all Albertans 24-7 and is in over 170 languages. Mm -hmm. The Family Violence Info Chat Line, which is in the show notes, is available 24 hours daily in English. Emergency shelters throughout the province provide safe locations to stay for people fleeing violent and abusive relationships. That information, that link is in the show notes as well. And other supports are available. Please, 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 please reach out if you're in trouble. Because I don't want to wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning and have someone dead and me thinking to myself what could I have done and I hope I've done my duty here by giving a platform for an hour for family violence Lana thank you so much for doing this well, well, well thank, thank, thank you for having me um, on Chris and um, yeah I, I think for those who are watching thanks for carving out the time to chat about this as well it was my pleasure to be here with you uh, everyone we will be back tomorrow morning at uh, Friday and uh uh, I promise it won't be as deep of a conversation, but we will be talking about the future of the Liberal Party of Canada, so be sure to tune into that one. Uh, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, have yourself a safe and happy Thursday, um, and just reach out if you need help. And for those who have listened, thank you. Talk to you later. <laughs>